Israeli air and artillery strikes have continued through Wednesday and Thursday, turning Gaza, according to at least one reporter who is coming to us from the ground, uh, as he called it, uh, from the world's biggest open air prison into a mass grave. The situation is indescribable. Uh, and uh, you must be watching live feeds as well as reports coming in from Gaza as well as from uh, Israel and keeping track of what's happening and the scale of the humanitarian catastrophe that is being faced by the over 2 million residents of Gaza. Uh, with strikes now targeting, with Israeli strikes that is now targeting the border cro crossing with Egypt at Rafah, uh, as well as rendering inoperable the airports uh, in Damascus and Aleppo in Syria. Are we heading from total siege to total war? In Hollywood, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers has halted talks with SAG-AFTRA. That's the union that represents actors and performers, as well as others, including web content creators, news broadcasters, and a host of other media professions, uh, saying that the gap between demands and what they're willing to give is too big. Uh, why is the union accusing producers of using bullying tactics? And finally, the 13th edition of the ICC Men's Cricket World Cup is underway in India. Those who might not follow the game will be surprised to note that the biggest game of the tournament is not necessarily the final, but is the game between India and Pakistan that will be played on the 14th of October. We talked to veteran cricket journalist Sharda Ugra about where one day cricket stands today. Is it a celebration of a sport that has been well and truly decolonized or a massive pre-election rally for India's ruling party? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief, brought to you by People's Dispatch. If you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Right, our first story uh, is no surprise, of course, we're talking about uh, the latest from Gaza and from Israel. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is in Israel and held a joint press conference with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, the key point, at least from uh, my perspective as, a, as someone listening in, uh, was the claim that the U.S. and Israeli militaries are following and always follow uh, international law as well as the rules of war and do not target uh, civilians. But from the pictures that we're seeing and from testimonies coming in from civilians, from health workers, humanitarian aid workers, officials, uh, doctors, journalists from Gaza, uh, the, the evidence points in the absolute opposite uh, direction. At Al Shifa Hospital, which is the largest medical complex in Gaza, the morgue is so full that first a tent had to be erected outside to house some of the bodies. And now that even that has been filled to beyond capacity. Uh, bodies are just being kept outside. That is the actual state of, uh, of the situation uh, right now. The entire population pretty much it seems is without fuel, food, medicine, uh, water. Uh, and at the time uh, that we went into recording, uh, Netanyahu was preparing to address the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, uh, and make a formal declaration of war as required by Israeli law. Uh, this will, of course, mean that the war cabinet will start functioning and will not require parliamentary approval for most actions, including military actions, at least those that pertain to Gaza, uh, unless they want to open up uh, different fronts of the war, uh, which in the context of the raids uh, against uh, Syrian airports in Damascus and Aleppo uh, are not entirely, is not entirely out of the question. Um, meanwhile, in southern Israel, incursions by Hamas fighters have continued. They are sporadic, but they are still continuing, and the Israeli military uh, is still dealing with those. Uh, civilians have been asked to evacuate those areas. Uh, but Netanyahu's response has not been to pull back. Instead, it said that Israel's response to Hamas will change the Middle East. Uh, Anish is with us on Daily TV today, as he has been every day uh, covering this major story. And the tragic and horrific, I don't know, no words to describe what, what is going on in Anish at the moment. Uh, but uh, from your uh, understanding and from your reading of the news as well as reports that you're getting, uh, what are the most important points since we last uh, spoke to People's Dispatch uh, readers? 
Well, obviously, the Blinken visit is the big news right now. Uh, not because because it's the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State there, but because of the manner in which uh, the U.S. is so blatantly. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Same issue again. I can't hear Anish. Oh. We'll start from. Can we start from the answer? Yeah, I, we uh, can. What should I do? Should I, I leave and come back? Can't you, can't you hear me? It's so weird, man. I could hear you fine before the recording started, and now it's just gone. Um, I'll try to leave and rejoin. Okay. Is that okay should I? something hello yeah back now. Can, you, can you hear me now yeah yeah okay so i'll start with the answer okay in five seconds yes Sudan. so uh, currently obviously the blinken visit is something uh, that is a major development not because it's a uh, you know a u.s secretary of state visiting but primarily because of how blatantly the u.s uh, is expressing its solidarity uh, and i say blatantly primarily because it is happening uh, essentially at a war zone and uh, the united states is taking a very partisan side in this manner in the, in the manner in which uh, that it has never done before uh, and uh, you can actually see how uh, the kind of language that they talk uh, that that was uh, you know evident with uh, Blinken's speech, uh, where he says that U.S. is uh, going nowhere uh, and uh, it is there be uh, and uh, you know backing up Israel and very clearly at a time when you know there is a massive uh, siege and a blockade that is cutting off everything that is essential for human life uh, in this densely populated area. And it is, uh, uh, you know, it would be unthinkable to imagine that the U.S. Uh, leadership is not aware of this atrocity happening, that they have, it has been communicated to them by multiple uh, organizations, by the United Nations, uh, you know, groups within the U.S., uh, U.N. as well, and the United States as well. So this is not something that they're not aware of. They're very well aware of the catastrophe that is going to unfold. Uh, considering that it is nearly now 24, hours, more than 24 hours that there has been no electricity supply in the region. There is no, uh, you know, the, uh, they will be running out of drinking water very soon. Uh, hospitals are not able to function because of the lack of electricity. And, uh, you know, food supplies, medicines, nothing is going through. And Israeli administration, Israeli military leadership is blatantly saying that they are going to withhold all of these essential provisions, utilities, as long as the there are their prisoners, uh, their soldiers continue to be prisoners in Gaza. And that is a very, you know, it's a ret it is not merely just retribution we are looking at. It is a collective punishment of the sort that we have not probably seen in recent uh, decades even uh, of any kind of war to imagine. Like even some of the recent wars we have uh, reported or actually talked about, we have seen, you know, uh, uh, combating uh, sides, parties actually, you know, giving way for humanitarian aid at some level, and uh, you know, even give, uh, making way for a humanitarian corridor when there needs to be, um, you know, when there happens to be a massive displacement of people. We are already looking at close to four hundred thousand people about to be displaced, uh, and that is, uh, you know basically a fifth of the population already and despite that there is this very you know uh, emphatic us uh, support compared to their very vague and very you know piecemeal statement of uh, to the israeli authorities that 
uh, they should uh, make sure that no uh, civilian lives are lost in the battle and that they should be level headed it's a very piecemeal statement it makes no sense they are not telling they're not putting any conditions but their support is quite emphatic and unconditional and that itself sh shows why israel is emboldened uh, if at all it actually goes through uh, a ground uh, invasion of gaza which would be disaster in it, in its own self but it is going to it is something that we are veering towards at this current moment in time uh, Anish, at this point, uh, you would hope or you would have hoped for uh, some kind of statesmanship, leadership uh, to emerge and the conversations uh, at that level to be somewhat different from what we are seeing on, let's say, social media, for example. Uh, of course, you cannot blame civilians on either side uh, for, for the kind of stance that they might be taking. but. Uh, what we are uh, the kind of sort of division or polarization that we are seeing is being repeated particularly by uh, israel's uh, allies in the west in europe where they are still fixated on getting the palestinian authority to first condemn uh, what hamas did in these attacks uh, how do we expect any forward movement uh, any safeguarding of, like like they said in the joint statement, Netanyahu and, and Blinken, uh, that civilians are not being targeted. If, if you're going to turn the water off, you're going to turn the lights off, you're going to turn the fuel off, uh, how is that different? How, uh, how, how can you say that you are not targeting civilians? This is aside from, of course, the artillery and the constant uh, airstrikes. Exactly. Uh, it is definitely uh, something like even the, when uh, it was posed to them, these questions, these exact questions, uh, there was evasive answers. And uh, in most cases, uh, like Blinken kind of did not really answer, bother to answer many of these questions. In some, he actually just talked about how Hamas is a terrorist organization uh, or that it is uh, using people as human shields. Uh, like an entire um, uh, armed wing cannot use a population of 2 million people as a human shield when it's that 2 million people that is being bombarded very arbitrarily, indiscriminately, uh, who are being with, uh, you know, deprived of all sorts of resources. So the attack is on Gazan people and not just Hamas as uh, Israel or the US wants to think it is or wants its people to think it is. Um, mm. On the other hand, uh, like when you talk about statement, statesmanship, you actually need to talk about uh, the kind of behavior that the U.S. leadership has actually uh, presented. Uh, the president himself was caught uh, sharing a fake news about uh, atro atrocities supposedly con uh, conducted by Hamas. And that clearly shows uh, the incapability of statesmanship by uh, the US, uh, US government or people in the US government right now uh, because they it's mostly reactive their entire uh, presence there it's quite reactive they do not they are either um, completely uh, un, uh, overlooking the consequences of a ground invasion or the catastrophe that it will cause or uh, they're just uh, uh, some, they're, just, they're just not planning ahead of time. They're not looking ahead of what might happen and how it can actually create a wider altercation in the region if something of that sort happens. And let's not even talk about you know the humanitarian catastrophe that is unfolding at the moment. So this is not something that the U.S. government is very... Um, uh, you know, forward thinking at this point uh, when it comes to its policy on Israel and Palestine, of course. Uh, so definitely there is this one thing about uh, the U.S. being completely on its side. But then you are also seeing some difference in the Western leadership in other places. There are already uh, EU governments who are very, there are reports talking about how many of them are concerned about the humanitarian cat catastrophe that is going to unfold because of you know complete blockade of the region and no mm. access to anything basically or to the outside world and that is something that many of uh, that is also preventing many of them from for going from uh, you know uh, you know very uh, going for unconditional support of the israeli leadership at the moment 
So definitely there is that aspect that uh, needs to be considered. But obviously, US is going to be quite suicidal at this point, considering that their foreign policy has been quite confused for a while now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are also looking at a situation where, you know, uh, Israel is also unraveling in many ways. We're already seeing uh, Netanyahu being, uh, you know, reaching his lowest uh, in opinion polls and approval ratings, primarily because he's being blamed for the Hamas attack, uh, for the intelligence failures, the military failure of the entire uh, situation. So there is an unraveling happening within Israel as well that is also not given as much attention as it should be at this point in time. Right, and maybe we can get a bit more into that, uh, Anish, when we, when we have you back on Daily Debrief uh, tomorrow, of course. But uh, meanwhile, while Blinken is in the region, uh, there, there are also reports that he will meet Mahmoud Abbas uh, of the Palestinian Authority in Jordan. Uh, any any uh, sort of uh, inputs on that front? It is very hard to say uh, what the agenda will be because of the kind of... Uh, one thing we need to understand is that the Palestinian Authority has refused to tow uh, the Western line uh, when it comes to you know, uh, talking about the attack by Hamas. Uh, it's, they are not, like we have seen multiple statement, statements by uh, their representatives, their leadership, even their, uh, the representative speech at the United Nations of how it is more important to talk about Israeli violence and continued Israeli colonization on uh, on the Palestinian people than it is to talk about whether or not Hamas was right in uh, doing its attack. And that clearly shows that there is definitely obvious pressures from uh, the ground, like most Palestinians do not necessarily see uh, the attack as uh, as something that is beyond justification. Uh, obviously, they might disagree with the tactics, but they do not look at it as something that is uh, as contemptible as, say, the Israeli, uh, the continued Israeli violence and the escalated Israeli violence that Palestinians have been going for about for the past two, two or three years, actually. And uh, obvious, uh, obviously, the 15, uh, sorry, the 17 years of uh, blockade and all sorts of colonization, uh, the attacks on Al-Aqsa, which again happened uh, yesterday the day before yesterday as well uh, by uh, an armed uh, battalion uh, that were you know supporting tourists and a, a group of Jew, uh, jewish settlers so all of this is happening at the same time and there are also already killings happening within west bank so this is there is some definitely something that the palestinian authority uh, will obviously not be seen as condemning Hamas or its attack. So I'm very curious to see what Blinken is going to achieve or if he actually seeks anything from the Palestinian Authority at this point in time, because they are not going to toe that line. Uh, they are not going to uh, become, uh, you know, the pacifist at this moment. They might mm. seek for uh, a negotiated solution for the current crisis, but they are not going to go beyond uh, their way to condemn Hamas at this point in time. And that is one thing for sure. All right, Anish, we'll of course ask you to keep tracking uh, those developments as well as uh, whatever does happen in the Knesset and how that official declaration of war uh, will result in further escalation or, or what happens next. Uh, but we'll ask you to hang around because we're talking about another story that you've tracked for uh, People's Dispatch. Um, in Hollywood or in the, in the US on Wednesday night, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which is the, the, the sort of umbrella body that represents, among others, the big studios uh, in the US, they called off negotiations against, uh, with, sorry, uh, the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of TV and Radio Artists, which represents uh, over 150, 160,000 performers and media uh, professionals uh, across the board. Uh, saying that the gap between what the studios are willing to accept or offer uh, and what the latest proposal from the union was, uh, the gap is is too wide to uh, to bridge. Uh, the union, of course, has responded saying that uh, the, the studios are using bullying tactics, including completely exaggerating 
the cost of this proposal in one case a report i was reading said that it was exaggerated to the media by as much as 6% uh, but meanwhile there is a bit of good news on, on the strike front the writers guild of america has ended its nearly 150 day strike after ratifying a tentative agreement with the same association of producers uh, anish we'll start with the good news uh, if we can um which is that uh, potentially the writers uh, strike or oh, the writers strike is off and, and uh, writers who uh, work in these various industries from television to radio to news um, will go back to work uh, how did that happen and what are the details of of the agreement well uh, obviously the strike worked and uh, writers got uh, a deal that they actually wanted uh, we are looking at a ratification rate of uh, about 99% close to 99% and that clearly shows there was this overwhelming support from the writers association the writers guild uh, and that also kind of shows that they got exactly what they wanted from the mm. amptp and this is uh, something that uh, uh, that was uh, considered to be unworkable uh, just a couple of months ago so uh, in the current scenario what we are looking at is a couple of demands uh, key ones include uh, a 5% uh, immediate increase in wages minimum wage and uh, a 4 and a 3 and a half percent increase in 24 uh, 2024 and 2025 and so this uh, agreement will actually see about uh, you know more uh, clearly more than 12% uh, wage hike and obviously uh, a 12% hike in uh, minimum wages for uh, uh, you know contributors and you know uh, writers who do not necessarily work for credit in most cases uh, mm-hmm. and uh, there will also be an, a hike a uh, contribution from uh, employers contribution for uh, pensions and uh, healthcare uh, in the contract which is something that they have been fighting for for years actually this was even before uh, the current contract uh, uh, came into place uh, so this was a very long standing demand that they actually uh, secured but most importantly it is the uh, the protections against uh, against ai the use of ai in uh, the writing process the creative process that uh, that is actually quite significant because uh, one of the things like for instance some of the conditionalities that they have put up is that there won't be any uh, ai uh, generated material uh, or literature that will be used or uh, you know even rewritten materials that will be used without uh, the consent and the advice of the writers in at the you know as part of the staff as part of the creative process so they will have to vet the entire uh, ai generated literature before they are actually used for you know the protection itself and mm-hmm. there's also uh, you know a very clear uh, distinction between uh, the fact that all writers including writers multiple writers who work on the same project will be treated as different employees so they will ha- also have a uh, significantly different uh, pension and uh, health uh, care sorry not different as in like a uh, segregated uh, pension and health care which was which is not what it used to be it used to be a shared pension and health care plans for uh, writers who work on the same project so both of these clearly show a big progress that our writers have been calling for for a long while now uh, at the same time uh, writers have talked about the fact that they are not going to stop the picket they they have obviously rat- ratified the deal but they will continue to pick it uh in solidarity with the sag aftra so this is something that is going to be a significant movement in hollywood because something of the sort was never seen before uh, we are already looking at uh, uh, a double strike that happened after nearly 60 years uh in hollywood and that definitely has its uh, has had its impact and so mm-hmm. when you look at the actors and performers strike it is a very signif- uh, it is slightly different set of uh, demands that are uh, significant that are important for them uh, even though the mbtp says that it is going to give them the same set of uh, contract but that is definitely not what we are looking at right now. so 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 uh, any very quickly because we are uh, very short on time Uh, but any further details on uh, what these gaps are that the studios are saying are unbridgeable 
Well, uh, it is uh, very difficult to take uh, the producers on face value or the studios in face value because uh, what we have seen is that they have clearly overestimated uh, the cost that will that they will have to incur in the new contract that the writers have, sorry, the actors and performers have presented to them. In fact, uh, what the sag representatives have talked about is the fact that uh, the current deal, that the, the new deal that the AMPTP has uh, presented is uh, mm. substantially lesser, uh, you know, even qualitatively and quantitatively from what they actually offered before the strike even began. So they have actually brought down uh, the negotiate. They are actually trying to use a certain kind of negotiation tactic, which is essentially bringing down the offer uh, and, you know, forcing the uh, forcing the workers to actually admit to something lower than what they had actually set out for. So definitely, mm -hmm. uh, this is a certain kind of pressure tactic, and uh, there is a good deal of uh, truth to when uh, truth to the claim that it is a certain kind of bullying tactic by the producers. So we will have to wait and see. There are more details need to be uh, uh, awaited because obviously negotiations are underway. So uh, what we are looking at is a very uh, hostile uh, producers guild uh, trying to. Uh, you know, uh, pressured actors and performers, many of whom actually may are uh, making quite substance, subsistence uh, wages through yeah. uh, their career. And uh, that is about 160,000 workers in the uh, industry who require these uh, new and, you know, better uh, deal for them to actually make a, a you know, decent living in at the very least. All right, Anish, thanks very much for uh, all of those updates and, and uh, I'm sure I will see you again very soon. Right, our final bit for today, uh, you may or may not be aware that the 13th edition of the ICC uh, Men's Cricket World Cup, uh, One Day International World Cup, that is, is underway in India as we speak. There's a game going on uh, today as well. Uh, but the biggest game of the tournament, irrespective of what might happen, unless, of course, the same two teams reach the final, uh, it's a game between India and Pakistan that will be played at the Narendra Modi Stadium uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, in the state of Gujarat, uh, which of course, uh, of which of course Narendra Modi was chief minister for many years before he became prime minister uh, of India. Uh, Shada has Ugra is joining us. Uh, she has of course covered many many World Cups. Uh, and uh, has a quite extensive set of views on the tournament. Uh, Shada, uh, thanks very much for joining us on Daily Debrief. As always, I know you're a bit rushed for time, so we'll keep it as quick as possible. Uh, so, uh, good, bad, and ugly, essentially, is what we're looking at. Uh, let's start with the good. Uh, hi, Siddhant. Great to be on the Daily Debrief, as always. Uh, I think the good is the, the quality of the cricket that we'll see played. Uh, between these 10 countries that are the top nations in world cricket. There are many arguments to be made uh, for the fact that, look, it's a World Cup. Rugby's got uh, 20 teams, 30 teams, whatever. Football's got 32 teams. Rugby's got 20 teams. Why can't cricket have more than 10? Uh, but the quality of the cricket that we'll see will be quite extraordinary. Uh, you know, there's always that. And, and, and the whole atmosphere that will build around it in India, though some of the stadiums have not been full, uh, that will be without... without uh, doubt you know even sort of hardcore reporters like me will find myself melting at some point in time at some particular piece of the action that'll all that'll be fantastic all right uh, so so of course yeah we we would expect from a world cup uh, the apex tournament of the sport uh, for for that to happen uh, shanta just on the good if we can continue a little bit because uh, cricket is a sport that has a very strong colonial legacy it was of course uh, brought to countries like India, uh, South Africa, many other parts of the world, the Caribbean, of course, uh, by the British. Uh, do you look at it as a sport that has been successfully uh, decolonized and that, that countries like India today are running, uh, running the show pretty much, running the economy of cricket for sure? Uh, that's a very interesting take that you've taken on it. That's one take, saying that the sport has been decolonized. I certainly think the South Asian uh, subcontinent has uh, has changed the grammar and the tenor and the fabric of the sport and how it's played, as opposed to how it's played in England and Australia. That's that's a it's it's a very mass sport. It's a very public sport. It's played out in the open. 
uh, all year round, you know, on streets and gullies, which is not, it's, it's very regimented and organized in uh, parts of the Western world. Uh, but the other thing that says is that, look, cricket's always been an, imp an, an, an imperial sport. It's always been a colonial sport and the colonial masters of today. It was Britain and Australia previously, the colon colonial masters of today. Uh, is India. The colonial master of today is India and, and the Indian subcontinent and our, our television viewing audience. So that's definitely one way of looking at it. And I would actually um, answer to, uh, you know, uh, agree with the with the latter because of the way in which India and the BCCI, that's the National Cricket Board of India, uh, as to how it operates uh, uh, through the game. It's it's not done in a very uh, generous and, a, and, and an expansive and a, uh, inclusive manner. It, it's, it's pretty much a lot of bullying. Yeah, an example of, is this big game that we're talking about, the India-Pakistan game, which was meant to happen on the 15th, but because of, uh, I suppose, personal reasons, uh, the BCCI <laughs> was able to rearrange it. Uh, unheard of, perhaps, at, at an event like a World Cup in any sport, uh, that the host nation can determine fixtures and things like that. Uh, Shanta, you have, uh, of course, uh, you have been covering the World Cup. You're doing uh, video bits on the wire. You, you, you've had a a uh, long form story, a cover story out in the caravan where you're talking about uh, the involvement of uh, the ruling party in India uh, and and uh, the board of control for cricket in India. An interesting aspect because we often hear uh, talk from world bodies in sport about uh, keeping governance or governments outside of how sport is run. Uh, now, in the context of cricket, that's a conversation that never comes up in the Indian context. We talk about Pakistan, we can talk about, you know, Zimbabwe, we talk about South Africa to an extent when it comes to the quota system that they have in place. Uh, but, but in an Indian context, that somehow uh, remains taboo uh, to talk about. You're absolutely right. Uh, because of the fact that India controls uh, uh, the largest market uh, that the sport has, which then translates into television rights, which then translate into into revenues, and therefore control that the Indian board has on the rest, uh, on the other countries. And uh, the international body of cricket, which is the International Cricket Council, uh, has been over the last few years, it used to be a much stronger body. It used to have a certain amount of pushback, a certain caliber of leadership that spoke for the world game. There's nobody to do that uh, at this point in time. And it's reflected in how this World Cup has been conducted. Uh, you know, it looks short. It doesn't even look like a, a, a international governing body. Cricket doesn't look like a properly governed sport. It just looks like a little bit of shambles of, uh, of, of colonial legacy that's playing out itself in, in different forms and saying, no, no, we are standing up against uh, former colonial powers. You're absolutely not. You're behaving exactly like them. Mm. Uh, finally, Sharda, uh, we, we will hopefully have a longer conversation uh, with you. Uh, I don't know. Tomorrow will be a busy day, but maybe day after we can catch up and and get a, a sort of broader overview of what's happening, particularly with regard to the politics of the sport, because it is vital. Uh, but uh, concurrently, the International Olympic Committee's uh, sort of session is happening in Mumbai as well. Uh, as a cricket uh, journalist, primarily, how are you looking at some of those conversations that might happen? Is there an interest in joining the Olympic movement? Uh, there has been this big push towards joining the Olympic movement uh, from uh, uh, cricket. You know, uh, the BCCI has resisted it because that means all these uh, Olympic IOC laws will sort of tend to apply uh, doping, whereabouts clause, all the rest of it that they've tried to always hold up against. Uh, so there is definitely, but for the rest of the world, it will be a big fillip that you can get into the Olympic movement. Uh, and the Olympic movement would be happy to have cricket because of the kind of money that it it generates. And we have to point out here, Siddhant, that uh, in terms of nation versus nation global competition, after the FIFA World Cup and the Olympic Games, the uh, Cricket World Cup is the most uh, uh, valuable media property, uh, no matter that right. only 10 right. countries at the top may play it. So I think the Olympics is very much uh, part of a, a larger cricket conversation and calendar because then maybe they'll get some of these rules to apply that you can't change in the middle of a World Cup. You can't be changing schedules after the playing agreements have been signed. You know, all this kind of strange things that are happening. I mean, uh, visas being denied to Pakistanis or being delayed for the Pakistani cricket team itself is, is a mm. shocking thing would never have happened uh, had it been a properly run international tournament uh, and certainly not at the Oli I mean uh, at the olympic level despite the fact that there have been games in united states and russia and, and all the rest of it visa procedures have been fairly simple and streamlined it's either e you'll get the games you can sort this out and you can't sort this out there will be hell to pay but there's been no hell to pay 
uh, on the Indian cricket board at this point. All right. Uh, we will, of course, be also tracking those developments, Shada, at the IOC session uh, and to see if, if any actual meaningful uh, discussion or a vote even uh, is held on that subject. And, and then we'll catch up with you uh, to sort of analyze uh, that for us. But very interesting that you point out here that uh, where there are perhaps dozens of sport around the world that are uh, eagerly vying for being included or to be included in the Olympic program, here is a sport where those that run its global economy are uh, the ones that are perhaps pushing back against uh, being part of that movement. Thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us at People's Dispatch, Shada. Uh, have a good evening and we will catch you very soon. Uh, and with that, we also bring to close this episode of uh, Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the rest of the work we do. Uh, we'll be back same time, same place tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, until then, stay safe. Thank you for watching. Bye.